like for us to turn this morning to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now one verse out of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We'll read verse 7. And on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Looking upon that particular phrase there, we were gathered together to break bread. And now over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll read verses 2 and 3. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, and that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, for your great work at Calvary that allows us to be set apart unto you. Lord, we're thankful for the provision we have in you for this time to be set apart. And we're thankful that you have made every provision for us in Christ Jesus. And it is by faith that we can put our feet down upon this holy ground and come and bend our knees, bend our hearts before you, that we would be in a place to hear from the very throne of God. Lord, we're thankful how you in this day still speak. Lord, you have spoken to us over and over again. We confess we're dull and hard of hearing. But in your great love and your merciful patience, you speak to us again. And we come and we offer ourselves to you. We would have an expectant heart to see you, an expectant heart to behold you, and allow your very word to do that dividing of soul and spirit within our lives, Lord. We worship you for your wonderful presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recently we've been considering this matter together, both in ministry and prayer and through some of the reading of the Lord's table. And what we would like to consider this morning Consider it. I love these things. We try this two minutes ago, it works. We try it now, it doesn't. So, uh, could 
someone go downstairs in a classroom and get Josh Miller? We'll go ahead and start. You can close it and open it. You can do no, just leave. Don't let's leave it. Okay. What we want to look at this morning and consider together is this matter of the ch the Lord's table through church history. And why do we want to look at this? And what's really upon my heart is that we see the scriptures of how clear it is on the Lord's heart that his people remember him and gather around his table. We see that in the book of Acts they were gathered with a purpose to break bread. And we come this morning and we have just taken this table. So the question we have is how did we get from there to here? How did we really, how did we, how did all of this come about in our lives? And I really have this desire that, there's Josh, come on up, that we could get a, a glimpse at the preciousness of the Lord's table. Okay. It's too far up, I guess. Yeah, I click slideshow and nothing happens. So. Because it's not in the hat. All right. But I just have this desire that we could get, capture a glimpse of the preciousness of the Lord's table. Because if we can see that it came from his heart, you know, it's the Lord that originated this. And that as we see it, as it came from his heart, how through the centuries, ones that were captured by that in a living way, once it captured their heart, they didn't care of the cost. They didn't care of the circumstance that they went through. They didn't care of the false teachings that occurred. They were there in the faithfulness of gathering together unto him. And this can be encouraging to us because, all right. Okay. Oh, okay, I keep going. All right. People pointed, so I stopped. Okay. But we also will see through history how many people, as we look at the table, ended up either looking down upon it, looking upon it as very common, just ordinary, just a couple of symbols. But, and there are others that actually elevated it too high, made it some mysterious, made it a sacrifice, made it a, turned it into an idol. But what we're after is the reality of what we're looking for. You know, the Lord has entrusted us, as his people, with the testimony of Jesus. And as we consider this matter in the overall, the testimony of Jesus, one of the aspects of this testimony is the Lord's table. We have baptism. Huh? Good to go. All right. Thank you. Okay. We have, as we look at this matter of the aspect of the Lord's table, we can see how it's included in an overall burden of the Lord's testimony because it's all about Jesus. That's what it's about. Why do we have a table? It's to show us Jesus. Why do we have baptism? It's about Christ. Why do we have marriage? Is another testimony. It's because of Christ and what he, his love for this, himself and the church why, do we, why does he provide covering so that we'll see him as head? Over and over we see through, there are many aspects of the Lord's test, overall testimony. And specifically, just during this season, we've been considering this one aspect of the Lord's table. Now as we consider this, well, let's ask the question, you know, why do we really study church history? Now as we look at this historically today, we're going to look at it from a bird's eye point of view. It's just uh, to try to cover 21 centuries is kind of tough in an hour. Of course, today with the clock being off, I've got another hour and a half. Uh, so thank you. For, yeah. <laughs> but, and also, but you can't just look at the Lord's table in a vacuum. You've got to see the events and everything that impacted it and how the people were living in that time. But as we look at church history, one of the beautiful things about it, we see that our God is a God of purpose. Just as you look throughout the scripture, you see he had a purpose. As we look throughout history, we see that purpose continuing. And we see that he has a purpose and a testimony in the Lord's table. And in that testimony, it's something that we've been brought into. We've got a great heritage that we've been brought into. We, it's not just something that we're, we take now and we're not related this is a continual feast. 
actually as we celebrate this, we're just we're entering in and joining with ones who for centuries have done this and continued on. And it does. As we look at history and as we study the scripture, it keeps our perspective of the table in balance. Like we said, some can get it high, some can get it low. And as we see what God's heart is, it allows us to stay in that proper perspective and a proper balance. But we will also notice and will become very aware of the enemy's hatred for this table. The enemy hates this table, and there's a continual battle over that. And we need to be aware of that. Sometimes the battle, that one of his tactics can be lethargy. Some of his tactics can be physical to keep ones away. But it can be lethargic. You ever notice sometimes we gather on a Sunday morning and there's almost like a spirit of lethargy just sitting upon us? You think that just happened because you had a tough week? No, it's because the one person who knows the value of this table is the enemy. (laughs) And he hates it. And he's going to try every little tactic he can to rob Jesus of the glory that is due him. That's what our desire as we consider this table is so that Jesus would be glorified and put in his rightful place. Now, this, as we look at this table, we're taking it, we take the table every week. So is, it, is the table a tradition? Well, I will say the table is a tradition. Now, tradition in and of itself is a neutral word. You can have good traditions and you can have not so good traditions. And I'm going to draw a contrast and just use the word tradition versus traditionalism. And as you see in these two verses in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, with the the chapter related to the Lord's table, Paul is encouraging them. He says, hold firmly to the traditions that I'm sharing with you. But in the Gospel of Mark, our Lord had told them, you're neglecting the commandment of God because you're holding to the tradition of man. So what's the difference? The difference is the key is life. One tradition leads to life. Where there's that living tradition, that living desire to come and hold to what God has given us. It's that life we have. Others, where we fall into the traditionalism, it's just death. And it's because of man trying to preserve something in his own strength or preserve something that gives man glory. So let's not... Many times, uh, particularly for younger people, they hear the word tradition. And there's an automatic reaction. Oh, tradition is bad. No, it's not. Tradition in and of itself is neutral. The aspect, how we treat it and what it's speaking of is the reality there. So praise God, we can enter into this tradition, our great heritage of the living remembrance of of the death and resurrection of our Lord. Praise God for that. So when you look at this table, as we come to this table and you look at it, what do we see? Do we just see that cup and the loaf? Do we just see the outward? Do we see it as just a weekly holy event, a ceremony? Do we just see two symbols? But what do we see? That's why we sang that hymn. Here, O my Lord, I see thee. We're not coming to an inanimate object here. This, is a, this, is, this brings us to a person. We're not talking about remembering this little table in and of itself. But what we're coming is we're coming to Jesus. That's the joy of the table. It's not the joy of coming around and having this uh, event, we could say. But no, it's a joy of being in his presence and saying, Praise God, I behold here, oh my Lord, I see you face to face. And I can, as I see your face, I remember your death. I remember the agony. I remember the price you paid that I could be here. And that releases a spirit of worship from within us. We remember how because, as it speaks of in 1 Corinthians 10, because of his death, we've been brought into a preciousness of communion, not only with him but with one another. This great work that he's done. Oh, how, how marvelous it is. This is why... You know, we want to be able to just touch and see. When we see this table, what are we seeing? We should see a person. It's seeing him. The eyes of our heart are enlightened to behold him. But why, why are we even considering this matter of the Lord's table? Is it just to increase our participation on Sunday morning? Do we judge our commitment to the table by having more participation? 
Oh, we had 25 people pray today. That's a good meeting. Is that the standard? If that's our standard, brethren, we might as well pack it up and go home. <laughs> our standard is touching him. You know, we, we, Yes, we want participation. We want a freedom for many to enter in. Praise God for that. But that's not the goal. It's not the goal just to have a better time. It's not, it's not just learning what to do and what not to do. Yes, as we get an understanding of the table, we, there's some things we do. There's a remembering of him. And there are things that we don't do. It's, as we've said, it's not a time for us to be asking things for ourselves. It's a time of giving unto him. But that's not our goal and objective. What we're after is our remembrance is that testimony unto him in a living way. That testimony to his death and resurrection, his coming again, that newness of life we have. And actually, brothers and sisters, if the ta I appreciated a prayer we had in our group Wednesday night. A sister prayed that the reality of the table, the table would be very real to us each day of our life. Because, brothers and sisters, if the reality of Christ is not touching us, if we're not living and experiencing Christ six days of the week, how can we expect all of a sudden to come in on one day and all this worship comes out? There's, there's six days that we live with him, we enjoy him, we touch him. And as we gather together then there, and we were, behold this table, there's an overflow and a joy unto him. Oh, how he, we need to see this table speaks far more than just a one-time weekly event. This is a daily transaction with him of beholding him and allowing him to become so real to us. And then when we come together, there's this great overflow of worship, adoration, and remembering him in his proper place. Let's not isolate it just one day a week. This is a, it's a life he's after. He's looking for his life to be lived out among his people. And then as we gather, what an overflow we, we come into. Now, we've, I said a minute ago, how have many considered this matter of uh, table through history. And generally ones have, have made it either too high, they've made it like very mystical, mysterious, ceremonial, and it's like an idol. They just lifted it up so high. And others, uh, tragically, in the, the day, much of the time in the days we're living in, it's just become ordinary. It's just become so common, taken for granted. Just become a couple of symbols. But this is not just symbols, this is a testimony of a spiritual reality that we have in him. So as we look through history, we want to look at some of the saints that have gone before us. The Lord captured them, and they had a desire to gather with that purpose of remembering him at his table. They want to remember his love and the price that he paid. And it didn't matter of the circumstances or the days or the times or the costs that they had, but they came there with a singleness of heart because they were captured by him, and they were given unto him. So we'll start, we'll just look at the second and third centuries. This is right after our Lord's life. And we're very thankful that during this time, there are many believers that were still maintaining the simplicity. Now most of the time, they still met in homes because Christianity was illegal. And the, real, the reason it was illegal was because if you lived in the Roman Empire, you were expected to worship the emperor. And once you were saved, you knew you could not worship that emperor anymore. And so you became an outlaw. And, but as you read their various writings, you see how they always spoke of loving, of gathering together on that first day of the week to break that bread, to remember the Lord. There was a, a desire there that brought them together. And they lived so, during some difficult times. There was, as it said, there were ten persecutions during this period. Now, they were sporadic as far as it wasn't like continual persecution. It would go for a season, it would stop. It was also regional. It wasn't always empire-wide. They would pick an area, maybe in Italy, or they'd pick an area over like Turkey or some area, Asia, and they would have severe persecutions. It was really only a couple of times that where the whole empire was focusing on destroying Christianity. But praise God, even though... There was a focus on trying to destroy Christianity. 
the Lord through his table, through his testimony, was able to continue to hold the saints. But we do start to see the effects of ones that are, are, are falling away from what the Lord, from the simplicity and purity of a devotion to him. Even during this time, we start to see a rise of what the so-called clergy, so-called special group of people, so-called more religious ones. And also, the, there start to be some talk about these elements taking on certain mystical meanings, certain very, they weren't just a simple bread and cup, but they started taking on some mystical meanings. I don't know how this uh, chart shows up. Those of you in the back, you read by faith. So, <laughs> but you'll see that during the second century, the, in the big print, it, it was that continuation of what we saw in the scriptures. There was that, it was a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord. It was a gathering to remember him. One of the items that we have during that time was a, a set of writings called the Didache. And it was that simply it means teaching in Greek. And it shared, if you look through those writings in that time, it just spoke of how once gathered in a simply simplicity with that single cup and a single loaf to remember the Lord. This was continued on in a living way. And toward the end of the second century, there was one brother named Justin Martyr. And he was the first one to use the term Eucharist. Now, how many have heard the word Eucharist? Yeah, <laughs> all right. That's Actually, that came out of one of the verses that we read in 1 Corinthians 11. Eucharist simply is the Greek word for thanksgiving. That, it means when the Lord gave thanks, he blessed the bread. That's The Lord gave Eucharist. That's what, uh, that's what that fancy word means. It's a simple word for thanksgiving. And it was first used. But then it started taking on more of a, a mystical uh, meaning. And... Then in the third and fourth centuries, <clears throat> that sacrifice, it became both sacrificial. It was talking about ones were using phrases like, oh, we offer Christ back to you. It was starting to take on these mysterious elements. And they were starting to see how, oh, a priest has to pray. Somebody, one of the clergy has to pray over the table now. It just can't be open to anybody. Uh, but we're thankful how... The Lord, is he kept ones faithful through this time. As we start to see some beginnings of a deterioration, of beginnings of getting away from that simplicity and purity of devotion to him. At the end of the, that third century, beginning of the fourth century, it was when Constantine came in. And there was a great transition because when Constantine became emperor, he basically legalized Christianity. Now, he had, in 312, he had his conversion, and his question marks there because there's still a debate today over whether Constantine really got saved or not. He says he did. Was it just a, a strategy to motivate his troops? We don't know, but praise the Lord knows, and we hope he did get saved. Uh, but through Constantine, he proclaimed a freedom of religion, and he legalized Christianity. But in doing that, there, started, there became a merger of the church, Christianity became the state religion. And we started to see so much mixture. And the church became, at that point, open to everybody. It became open, it became popular, it became accepted. And so many unbelievers came within the church. And now this is where we have to start. Up to this point, we could very comfortably use the word church. <laughs> but now there's a mixture. So... Hopefully, through as I'm sharing, when I'm speaking of the church, I'm speaking of God's desire and his heart. And Christendom or Christianity will be the, the mixture and everything else in the, pure, the, in the way that it's been mixed and all. But one of the impacts, what, one of the things that he did was he moved the capital to Constantinople. Now, it had been in Rome. And when he moved out of Rome, there became a political vacuum there. And there had already been some teachings about how important the bishop of Rome was. And so when Constantine left, that bishop of Rome seized power. And from that point on, the Roman system gained more and more power uh, throughout. It became a worldly power. It became a tremendous religious power. And it, it was started to control everything at this point. Now, I want to take a minute and look through the, the history of how 
the, of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting. Up before this point, if you had asked any believer, were they part of the Catholic Church, they would have said yes. Because Catholic simply means universal. <laughs> That's what Catholic means, it means universal. Okay, so up to this point, if you say, are you a member of the Catholic? Yes, absolutely. I'm a member of the Catholic. We're a member of the universal church. But it, from this point on, it becomes a, that Roman Catholic church. It takes on a whole different dimension. But we'll see, basically, as you go through this, we see how not only is man gaining power, how, like in 300, the bishop and the priest had to start praying over the elements. You had to have somebody special to pray over and bless these elements. And then the mass was introduced. And the mass is simply a reenactment of the, the, of the crucifixion. Every time that mass is celebrated, there's a reenactment. And you know, one's talking about how many, think of the thousands and millions of times Christ has had to die in the mass. But as Steve read this morning out of Hebrews 10, we know he, he died once for all. Praise God. And then as it, as it continued to gain more and more power, they were saying how there's no salvation outside of the Roman system. And this was a terrifying thought to people. Most people couldn't read. They, whatever the church told them, they believed superstition increased. And they said, if you don't belong to this Roman Catholic church, you're not saved. You're going. And so that was a tremendous fear factor that came on. And as it continued evolving, then the, the teaching First, the teaching of, of transubstantiation was introduced, and then it was formalized. And this transubstantiation, the big word there, it simply means when they, they, you take, as you look at this cup and this loaf, that the bread is actually and literally physically changed into the body of Christ, and the blood is changed, I mean the, the cup and the wine is changed into the blood of Christ. It's not a testimony of it. It's not even symbolic. It actually occurs. And, and that's the teaching. Uh, and we know from Scripture that's, that's a false teaching. So, but we just see through this that in how when man is left to himself, the, there can be such power and control and domination. And they have been, they've gotten so far away from the original simplicity and purity and the tragic thing about it was, if you did not agree fully with the Roman Catholic Church, and let me let me say one thing. When I'm at various times, I'll refer like to the Roman Catholic Church or maybe Protestants, this or that. We're not referring to the brothers and sisters within those groups. We're referring to the system <laughs> there. You know, we we leave brothers and sisters with the Lord. We're referring to the system and the influence that it has. That's that's the reference. Let me just give that little caveat for clarity. But if you didn't fully agree with the Roman Catholic Church, you were persecuted. If, and because of that, you know, they suffered tremendously. And oftentimes we can ask, why, how could the church justify persecuting ones? Actually, there's a very good scriptural basis for it in their mind. There's a verse in Luke, in Luke 14, 23. It's the parable of the dinner. And as he's inviting ones in and ones are not coming, the, the host says, compel them to come in. So persecution, the goal of persecution is compelling them to come back to the Catholic Church at this time. So we can see, you can use scriptures for anything. <laughs> you can use them out of place. But we want to, what we want to see is how these ones were faithful. And you know, in these days, we're thankful for their faithfulness because where man was gaining authority, there were those that saw how the scripture was the authority. And again, they saw that the Lord's table was only for those who were believers. It wasn't open to anybody. The Lord's table is for those who believe. And that the Lord's table, as we looked in the scripture, it, it's not, you don't need a, a special person. You don't need a priestly function person to, to pray over. Anybody can. And so these ones, they were simply standing in the simplicity and purity of what they had seen in the scriptures. You know, because what was occurring here also during this time, as the power of the Roman Catholic Church increased, the power and the value of scripture decreased. And you had the teachings and the traditions 
of the, the Pope and the priest became, at one point actually said, is e the traditions of the fathers is equal with the scripture. So if there was, a, and there was, if there was a, a contrast, you would just go along with what man said. So you had man's word increasing and the word of God decreasing in power. And this is why ones were able to twist things and maneuver them around for their own benefit. But thank God there were these faithful witnesses. Because in dark times, God always has a testimony. One of the beautiful things as we look through the, the history, it can be the darkest of times, God always has a wonderful testimony. Yes, they suffered great persecutions, and they were called heretics. They simply called themselves believers, but they were always faithful to the word of God. Whether we're talking about Priscillians, Montanists, Novatians, and you can see all those other names, the Bogomils, the Waldensians, and all, we see how faithful they were. Priscillian was a, a, a dear saint who lived in Spain. His final testimony was that it's an abomination to take the Lord's table with unbelievers. And they, asked, they offered him an opportunity to repent, and he said, no, it's an abomination to do that, and they killed him. He was martyred in 385. If we, from the writings of those, uh, the Bogomils, we can see how it said their, their typical gathering on the first day of the week there was a simple white cloth spread over a table which included the scripture, the bread, and the cup. All who believed were welcome to read from the scripture because at that time everybody didn't have a Bible. But there it was. If you wanted to come read, you could read. You could share something. All could come read and share. All could pray. And all who believed could take of the bread and cup. There was a sim simple simplicity there. Many of these, like the Friends of God and the Waldensians and some of the others, because the persecution was so severe, they quite often they had to meet out in the forest or they had to meet in the mountain. They met in caves. And to, because they had, this is what it, the reality of what the Lord's table was to them was a life. And they had this desire, regardless of circumstances, to come together, to go, to go into a mountain cave and celebrate this remembering of him. Oftentimes, tragically, they were betrayed, and they would be slaughtered. At times when they were caught in a cave, the persecutors would simply light a fire at the entrance to the cave, and they would go in later and clear out the bodies. It's tragic what one's, the price that one's paid. We take this so simple. We come, we don't... Would we appreciate it? in a greater and a fuller way. And God, he continued to move through these faithful ones. We can see how one, the, the, there were these ones that were forerunners to the Reformation, ones like a Wycliffe and a Huss. And of their writings, they, they not only denied, but they were attacking. <laughs> they took the offensive on, against this, the false teaching of transubstantiation and how the table should be open to all believers. It was what the Lord had says, all of you do this in remembrance of me. And they were, of course, they ended up, both of them were, were tried and condemned. It's a marvelous testimony of Wycliffe how after he was condemned to die, there was an earthquake in London. And they, they were so, they were, the persecutors were so terrified by that, they just left him and let him die. And it's an old age because there are never earthquakes there. But, but in the, you can see the hatred of the enemy. Sixty years after his death, they dug his bones up and burned them, <laughs> just to prove a point. Now Huss, they had, he was going to go on trial, and they, they, had, they said, come, you, know, you, can, you can represent yourself. You can share all you believe about the Lord's table and other matters. So he freely went. He ended up being betrayed. As soon as he got there, they arrested him. <laughs> uh, they arrested him and burned him at the stake. I mean, these ones, there was a, it was, it was, they were captured not by an event, not by a ceremony, but a person. A person had captured their life. And they were loving not their lives literally unto death. But praise God, because of their faithfulness, we know that there was the Reformation. And the Reformation had a great impact. We're thankful how it restored that authority of the Word of God. The, as we said, the, the, in that Roman system, the word of God had lost its value. 
but there were those faithful ones that knew the value of the Word of God. And through the Reformation, it came back in. And we could, as the Word of God was opened to people, all of a sudden they could read within the Scripture what the Scripture says about the table. It was open. They could see and behold that. They recovered they recover that truth of justification by faith that yes, Christ died once and for all and we're saved. Praise God. And that's what they could remember at that table. It also recovered how believers had that direct access to God. They didn't have to go through an intermediary. Didn't have to go through a priest. Didn't have to go through his mother. They could just go directly to God. They saw the, tr the truth of the priesthood of all believers but they really never practiced it. But tragically, they fell short of returning to the simplicity of the Lord's table as seen in Scripture. Luther and Zwingli actually had a big fight and a big disagreement. Luther still believed in transubstantiation. Zwingli saw it a little bit different. And they actually, it was one of the first divisions <laughs> that occurred was the division between Luther and Zwingli. That's why you had the Lutheran Church in Germany and you have the Reformed Church in Switzerland. Uh, divisions already starting. It's tragic. And it they boil down to a different view of the Lord's table and how tragic that was. But we see that in spite of, you know, we see the Lord doing many wonderful things, but in spite of the failures of man, God remains faithful. He continues to raise ones up. But as we come to the 16th century, we can see ones that are, they, the overall umbrella is the Anabaptists, but they're your Mennonites and Amish and Hutterites, and praise God, they recover the truth of believer's baptism. Now, when we're referring to believer's baptism, this isn't, um, we're not, they're not talking about battling over immersion versus sprinkling. Okay? They're talking about whether you baptize an unbeliever or a believer. Because in the old days, you could, they would baptize infants. And an infant is obviously not a believer. So you would, they wanted to, unless you believed, then you would be baptized. That's what the battle was over. And they practice that twofold meaning of the Lord's table. That, as it said in 1 Corinthians 11, that remembering of the Lord's death, his resurrection until his return. And then in that 1 Corinthians 10, the celebration of that oneness and unity that we have in him. There was a joy within their hearts. But again, they were greatly persecuted <clears throat> by the Rome and the reformers. But they were bringing about, they wanted everyone to, to see this reality. There's this one brother, Menno Simons. The Mennonites actually ended up getting named after him. One of his writings, he said, Dear reader, please understand that without a genuine belief in the Lord and repentance, the bread and the wine are of no avail to you at all. And they don't count before God. If, you don't, if you're not a believer, these things, they don't, they don't mean anything to you. They're no benefit to you. And they're no value. They don't count before the Lord. You just, that's it. I'm a, I did want, as I said, many have suffered persecution through this. And I could stand up here for a whole hour and just read of horrible stories. But uh, I'll uh, be merciful to us because it's just, it breaks your heart when you see what one's went through. I did want to read uh, just about two brothers. This is in 1537. <clears throat> they were living in Bavaria, and they were simple. One was a weaver, one was a baker. And they were arrested and confined for 16 days, and they were twice examined through torture. They were asked what they believed concerning the sacrament of the Lord's table. They spoke mightily against it, that it was an abomination and an idol before the Lord, and that it was not to be believed. They said, our Lord hung on that cross that we might remember him in a living way. They said that the supper was a memorial of his sufferings, death, and shedding of his blood, as it speaks in the gospel. To commemorate this, the purpose for which believers who are members of his body or his church were to observe it with sincere thanksgiving unto him. After that, each of them was separately put in chains, and six more times they were brought forth and examined. Now, both of these brothers were married and had families. They were, were able to write letters to their wives before their death. Uh, if you ever have, see a big book called Martyr's Mirror, their, <laughs> their letters are in that book. 
But they were brought, it says, each was separately put in chains in prison. Six times they were brought forth and examined in order to induce them to recant, which if they would do, mercy would be shown to them. But they would in no wise exchange the divine grace of their precious Lord for the favor of the world, since they felt assured that they were in the true faith and in the truth of God. The seventh time the priest came to them, they asked again, they denied again. They again tortured them. This time they, were, they racked both of them twice. The eighth time the judge came to them. After maltreating them, he sentenced them to be burned. But they, they had a hope in the Lord. They remained faithful and steadfast until the end because they knew that there was a divine truth that they had touched through the unspeakable riches and power of God. They were then burned for their faith, valiantly testifying of the truth and obtaining the crown of the martyrs. You know, those, when I read some of these stories, it can be very sobering. Uh, when we, I can see how lightly at times we can look upon this table. It shows us the battle. It shows us the importance. It shows us the significance. This isn't just a simple weekly time we come. There's a lot that we've been that's gone before us, and we're continuing on. Now, these are days of preparation. We speak of living in the end days. Right now, we're free to gather. We don't know what will hold the future will hold. We don't know what freedoms we'll have, what we won't have. We don't know how we'll be able to gather. We don't know what we will be questioned about. What what we will be challenged with. Today is a day of us really coming into that personal, intimate relationship with him. And the more we have that personal, intimate relationship with him, the greater the value of the table becomes to each one of us. Will the Lord continue to be working in that? Tragically, is, um, after the Reformation, many of the Reformed churches just reached a spiritual low. They ended up falling into the trap of much outward conformity. They had a focus on performance with very little emphasis on having a true relationship with the Lord. And it was during this time that Protestantism developed that the, the bread and the cup, they were symbols. They're only symbolic. Brothers and sisters, we use that word symbols at time. And, you know, but no, it, they're more than symbols. It's a testimony of a reality. There's a spiritual reality we're testifying of. They're not just symbolic of something. But there, there's a reality there. But during this time, God raised up those Puritans and the Pietists. And, you know, we're thankful for these. These are the ones that the Puritans you have like Baptists, Presbyterians, Scottish Covenanters, Congregationalists, Independents, all of these, this moves of the Lord. And we look at them today uh, and we say, oh, they've gone so far astray. But if you go back in history <laughs> and see the beginnings of some of these dear ones, there, there was a grand, marvelous touching of the Lord, and they were captured. And it's, it's, it's a shame how far away many have come from what the Lord originally had done with them. Also, there was the Pietists, and these were the Quakers, and the Pietist movement through Germany. And One of the movements that really impacted, and we'll look at a sec in a minute, is the United Brethren and the Moravians. They came out of that Pietist movement, and we see them surfacing in the 18th century. As we, by this time, many believers had, were scattered all throughout Europe. There was such severe persecution, not only by the Catholic Church, but by the Protestant Church. People, saints were scattering everywhere. There had been uh, many dear saints living in Moravia. Uh, this is where the United Brethren or Unitas Fratum started. And the, but because of the persecution, they were scattered all over Europe. And there really wasn't... Uh, anywhere for them to, to gather freely. But the Lord touched and captured uh, this one individual named Count Zinzendorf. And we don't have time to go into his personal testimony, but that's one of the recommended biographies for anybody to read is on Count Zinzendorf. But the Lord had captured this one in such a way. And he, so he had some property, bought, some pro brought, the pro bought property from his grandmother. And it became a place called Hernhut. And he opened it up as a refuge for all that were being persecuted. And because he was a count, he could provide them with safety and protection. 
the, the, the church couldn't come on, once could not come upon his property. And so he was able to provide this place. And so from many diverse areas throughout Europe and many different backgrounds, you had the Anabaptists, you had Waldensians, you had Lutherans, you had Reformed, you had so many backgrounds. They were coming together. And at first everything was wonderful. <laughs> no, but then as they started living together, the Calvinists were going one way, the Armenians were going another way, the Baptists said you had to do it this way, and the, the Waldensians said you had to do it, and so all of their various little things started surfacing, and so there was a great discontent and a great disharmony there. So after about five years, they, they had a time, they called for a time of prayer and repentance, and this was set for August 13th, 1727. Now this... This is actually a wonderful, significant day because in preparation for this time, Zinzendorf and the other, some of the other brothers, they went around to the different homes and they shared with ones on the preciousness and the reality of the Lord's table, of what the Lord had done, of his death, of what the Lord had done to bring them into a oneness. And then on August 13th, they gathered to take the table for the first time. They had just been a community living together. Uh, but as they found, they gathered uh, together for the first time to take the table on August 13th. And they sang, as they were starting, they, they sang this hymn, My Soul Before Thee Prostrate Lies. And thanks to Mr. Google, I was able to get a couple of choruses, a couple of lines. Uh, it's not in our hymn books or any of this, but uh, this was the spirit in which they gathered. They came and they were, as they were gathering, they, they were offering my soul before thee prostate lies. To thee, her source, my spirit flies. My wants I mourn, my chains I see. Oh, let thy presence set me free. Jesus, vouchsafe my heart and will with thy meek lowliness to fill. Vouchsafe means, <laughs> for us English-speaking people, uh, means graciously give us. Lord, graciously give us your meek lowliness within our hearts. That's what he's saying. No more her power, let my nature boast. Don't let me boast in my own self. But in thy will, may mine be lost. There was a surrendering unto him. And we're thankful for that. That as they were singing this, all of a sudden the, the spirit of God fell upon them. And there was powerful prayers of repentance, powerful prayers of supplication, powerful prayers for the Lord's interest. Their eyes were taken off of themselves. Their eyes were taken off of their differences. And their eyes were put upon the Lord. And they held him in a fresh way. And now even though they had known of the, the teaching of the, of the body of Christ, of their oneness, now they knew, they experienced the reality of the oneness that they had in him. And because the Lord, Lord birthed, many say this was the, the birthing of the, the Moravian church at this point in time. And out of this, on August 27th, they started a prayer meeting that went for 100 years. And it didn't come, nobody came with a plan to say, okay, let's get a 100-year prayer meeting together. <laughs> that ones just had a burden to come together and pray. And one started praying every day, 24 hours a day. It wasn't everybody. The ones, different ones would go at different times. It was a set place. And they would continue to pray. And they were praying for God's interest, praying for his heart, praying for the fulfillment of his desire. This was, as we look at some of the writings of those that were there at this time, I'll just read a couple of them. On the 13th of August, 1727, all the members of the flock in general were touched in a singular manner by the efficacy of the word of reconciliation through the blood of Christ and were so convinced and affected that their hearts were set on fire with new faith and love toward the Savior and likewise with having love towards one another, which moved them so far that on their own accord they embraced one another in tears and grew together into a holy union among themselves. So rising again, as it were, out of the ashes of, of the ancient times was the united brethren and the work that John Comenius had started. Another brother writes, It was truly a miracle of God that out of so many sects 
Catholics, Lutherans, Reformed, Separatists, Christians, and the like, we could have been melted together into one. Those who formerly, those who formerly could not bear with one another fell on one another's necks, pledging themselves most sincerely. And so the whole congregation became as a newborn child unto him, captured by him in such a marvelous way. I mentioned that this was, uh, the Moravians were the rebirth of what many call the United Brethren, a Unitus Fratum group. And one of the, the last brother in this group before they were just suffered such severe persecution was one called John Comenius. And he wrote, there's one of his writings, and it's called One Thing Needful. And one of the great quotes out of this, and it really summarizes, this was written in 1669. It can sound like today. It says, in short, Christendom has become a labyrinth. The faith has been split into a thousand little parts. And you're made a heretic if there is one of them you do not accept. What can help? Only one thing needful. Return to Christ, looking to Christ as the only leader. That's, it was a returning to These ones, as they gathered together, they were simply gathering. They didn't know what was ahead of them, but they gathered unto Christ. As they beheld him, as they allowed him to work in their hearts, he, he brought them into this revelation and got their eyes off of themselves. Out of this time, there was another a little phrase that came. And it spoke of, it says, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things love. You know, in those things that are essential in the Christian faith, who is Christ? What has he done? Those essential, vital things. There is a unity there. On those, what the phrase he uses is non-essential. And we could say this is interpretation. We know the, the, one of the vital, essential things is the Lord is coming back. But we don't know when or how he's coming back. There are many interpretations of the Lord's return. And we, have, we grant each other liberty in that, in their interpretations. As we, when Stella and I are in Brazil, many down there, as a brother and some are believed, they believe in the Lord's return will be post-trib. Now that's the, of all the alternatives, that's my least favorite. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, so, but we, we give one's liberty based on you know, the, where there's certain areas of interpretation. But the underlying thing is that in all things, there's love. In all things, there's love. And that's where, that's what the, that's the foundation, that's the testimony of this table, of his great love for us that has purchased us and redeemed us and brought us unto himself. Thank the Lord he continues working. We're moving on along here. We, so we look at the 19th century there, Sadly, there are you know, many denominations had formed by them. And if you weren't part of it, you couldn't take the Lord's table. And this is one of the most tragic things in history is that what Catholicism did was separate man from God. It, they put a layer in there. You could not have direct access to God. But what Protestantism has done is separated believer from believer based upon your way you think a church should be governed, whether you think it could be a congregationalist or Presbyterian, should there be this, based upon a teaching, should you be a Baptist, based upon, you know, Pentecostal, based upon your experience. We've divided, Protestant has separated believer from believer. Oh, but praise God, there was a growing desire during the 19th century for unhindered fellowship, that all these barriers would be broken down, and ones could really come and experience the oneness that we have in the Lord of gathering in that simplicity and purity in Him. And through that, and because of that, we have what was called the so called Plymouth Brethren. They never called themselves that. It's a historical description. And we always, you always have to name, everybody wants a name. It's like, where, where do you meet? I need a name. Well, so under pressure, these people, they, people call them the Plymouth Brethren. They, they always simply just call themselves brothers. They were the brothers, and that's how they got the name Plymouth Brothers. But in 1825, they're through Dublin, Ireland. We'll get my pitch in here for Ireland, Cecilia. Uh, we see that the, throughout the city, there were various brothers, two or three brothers at different homes, were breaking bread together. 
then after a, a short period of time, they, their, their paths crossed and they said, hey, why don't we come together? Let's gather in the simplicity and let's come together and break bread. In 1827, they did this. And it, it was a marvelous, the Lord touched, at the same time this was going on in Dublin, all throughout England and the, the British Isles, the Lord was touching many hearts in the similar ways of simply returning and gathering in the simplicity and purity of our devotion to him. And this was a powerful move all throughout England and, and throughout Europe too. When it was what we were seeing, there were many things the brethren uh, recovered and well, we're just looking at the Lord's table today. But we see how that this, they saw that this table was that visible testimony to that Lord's death and resurrection of his ascension, of his coming again. Praise God. And, and they were celebrating that unity and oneness of believers in him. And they were gathering in this simplicity. And th there was a beauty there. And it was, it was, it was, if you read some of the early writings during this first 20-year period, it was as if heaven came down and touched, and, and nobody, they, many of them were doctors or lawyers or this or that. They, they didn't use any titles because what the Lord, they were just brothers, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And they, what a joy, how they loved to gather at the table to express that remembrance of him. But because of this great move, the enemy took notice. The enemy took notice, and within about 20 years, we see that divisions started occurring between what's called the open brethren and the exclusive brethren. And again, we're looking at the table. We're not going to get into to all of that. But well, they had about a 20-year period, but then the, the enemy came in. The enemy takes notice because we see how he is really, he, how much the enemy hates the table. Well, as we're, as we're here today, you know, here we are. We've entered in to, for the, the blessing and the benefit of many of these. Now, the, the way... One of the lessons is, is we have been gathering together over these years because the way we take the table now, the practice is different than at the beginning. Uh, it has changed throughout the, the practice has changed. And one of the things, and I think it's important for us to see, is that there's a great, there's, a, there's two things related to taking the table that are important for us. One is there's a principle related to the table. The principle of the table is that it's one cup and one loaf. The principle is that our Lord died for us, and we're remembering his death. The principle is of our oneness in him. And then there's the practice side. Now, if you look in Scripture, the Scripture never really says, that doesn't touch on the practice side. It doesn't say how they did it. But it focuses on the principle. And we've, uh, I remember one of the, I'll call it one of the significant events <laughs> during our history together was when we made the transition to these little cups. Now, myself, I'm a one-cupper. <laughs> I'll let you know that. But that's, to me, the principle of the table. In the, the one-cupping, that's the non-essential. Okay? The more important is that unity, the oneness that we have in him. And as we fellowship together, because this was during the time when AIDS was becoming uh, just uh, becoming more well known, and people were concerned about germs and all of the spread of things, and so we we had a lot of fellowship about it, and meetings together. And I still, and it, I, I appreciated the spirit of those times because ones would say, "You just need to have faith, brother," and uh, I still remember one brother saying, "He said, now brother, if you want me to have faith." that this is the body and the blood of Christ, I have that faith. But if you want me to have faith that the germs have been killed, <laughs> I don't have that faith. <laughs> and so, and, but we were able to fellowship through it, touching the head, and the Lord kept us together. Through that, it, was, it, was, it got contentious at times. <laughs> you know, you putting expectations on people and back and forth, but through that, we saw that the headship of Christ. We saw we, in a living way, we experienced it. And we came into it. And that's one, one of the events and challenges that we have within the assembly that as far as I can remember, nobody got upset and left. <laughs> because even before that, what was happening, since we, we only had, we were doing the one, the shared cup, we actually had two or three cups, but we were sharing them. 
Some people weren't coming to the Lord's table until afterwards because they didn't want to take the, the, the cup. Uh, but put, praise God, afterwards, everybody was coming together. So that's, that's just one. There's other items too. But that's just it's one thing of how we need to, as we're looking at this table, focus upon what we're looking upon is the principle and the reality of it. That's what the, the Lord is after. And that's Christ. He wants us to see a person. So in summary, if we really, if we can just reflect and allow the Lord to capture us in a fresh way, that this table is not of man. This originated from his heart. As he was getting ready to depart, then one of the last things he shared with his disciples was do this in remembrance of me. Remember me this way. Because like, you know, we all relate with what was shared at the table by John. We, we all forget. I still can, uh, I, to me, that's one of the most humbling things the Lord has ever had to say was remember me. My grandmother, she never had to say remember me. I remember my grandmother. <laughs> your mother, your father, you, we remember them. But here's the Lord. Uh, <laughs> and all, he humbles himself. He, he, knew, he knows us. He says, remember me. And we can see that as we're looking at this table, we're looking at it in this season not to lift it up to make it an idol or to elevate it above where it should be, but just that we could see it in a proper perspective within the overall view of the testimony of Jesus. This is an aspect of it. It's a vital aspect. And as the Lord touches us with this, as we see the reality in our daily life, then there will be if that remembering of him. As daily we touch his death, daily we allow that resurrected life to come forth. When we gather on Sunday, there's that overflow as we shared. And as we touch one another, as we experience the oneness and unity we have in the body of Christ in the other six days, as we gather, we can enter in and express that. But we need to be aware in these days too of the enemy's hatred for this. There is a continual attack and a continual battle, not only over the table, but on the overall testimony of Jesus and how we need to stand in this day. Standing that we could be those that could maintain a simplicity and a purity of our devotion to him. He said, this is my cup. This is my body. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Would those words not become so familiar to us that they lose their preciousness? But in a very fresh way, would the Holy Spirit really breathe upon us? You know, would we be able, even during this week, take some time and say, Lord, as we read back through these verses in the Gospels and in 1 Corinthians, Lord, forgive me for taking this too lightly. Lord, allow me to see in a fresh way Allow me to see yourself. Allow me to see you in a way I haven't seen you before. As we touch him, we won't have to worry about our gatherings on Sunday. There will be that overflow. You know, many have said that uh, Spurgeon used to say in particular that the prayer meeting was the uh, uh, barometer, the thermostat of the church. Many ways, as we gather at the Lord's table, you know, that's another indicator of the level of life. I don't know who's bleeping, but uh, but there's a level of life that the Lord is looking for. Looking for that, He's jealous. He said He desired to take this table with us, and would we have that desire to really remember Him and allow us to to see in a very fresh way this the greatness of what we have brought into. Hebrews speaks of, <clears throat> of so great a salvation. This is a great thing we've been brought into. This is a great privilege we have. We're the most privileged ones on the earth to gather in the presence of a living God at a table that he has prepared before us. Our eyes are upon him. Here, oh my God, I see thee face to face. Let's pray. Lord, we come.
come to you and as we look away from ourselves, we do pray that in a very fresh and living way, you could touch our hearts on the reality of this table. Lord, where maybe we've made it, we, we can lift it up too high, we can make it too low. Lord, would you uh, bring us into your perspective? Lord, we pray above all that we would have a fresh glimpse of you and that we would be captured by you, Lord, and there would be a greater loving appreciation for who you are and of all that you have done. In thy name we pray.